uh, recommence the hearing. It's day five of stream four. Mr. Arnold, you're on the line. Can you hear us? Because we can't. Yes I can, hear you. yes, I can hear you. I was just muted as requested. Hey, no worries. Uh, thank you for coming in, uh, Mr. Arnold, a little earlier than you had been told, and we're ready to go. There doesn't seem to be anybody with any procedural issues. We seem to have sorted out your copywriting issue. Thank you for supplying, supplying us with a substituted uh, uh, statement. I think that that uh, will address the issue. Yes, so uh, we've got pretty limited powers uh, to make confidentiality orders, and uh, they don't last. So they yeah. wouldn't actually solve the problem. Understood. So uh, I think that that's a better solution. So um, yeah. we have your statement. We've read it. Uh, we've looked at the photos. Um, so what would you like to tell us? Okay, well, I'll sort of go through the text a bit. Um, Regarding the um, paragraph three of ARS five, which relates to dish aerials, um, I think as it stands, it says there must be no more than two dish aerials per site. And I think that is unduly restrictive, particularly uh, for the rural zone. And my reasons for saying that are that um, there is a very good grounds to be using multiple frequency bands and as I originally stated uh, in my submission you can perhaps use two frequencies on one dish but it's technically more difficult to go beyond that and therefore you need multiple dishes probably uh, six if you're going to cover all the amateur microwave bands um, but preferably up to nine to make things a bit simpler now, I don't think that that would necessarily cause any problems in terms of visual impacts um, because you do not need to mount those dishes uh, very high up uh, in the case of the higher microwave bands. There's a, a rule there regarding the wavelength in use and how high it needs to be, how high an antenna needs to be above the ground in order to give clearance. And so for a number of those microwave bands, quite a low height is acceptable. And in the, in the rural zone, that's not a problem. It might be elsewhere because of course uh, you need to, um, everything else to be not an obstruction. And you can arrange that uh, in, in a rural property. It might not be so easy in a residential area, certainly, or perhaps an industrial area. So that is my reason for requesting that that um, restriction in the case of the general rural zone be elevated to preferably nine uh, dishes uh, with the additional restrictions on diameter that I have also indicated. For um, some cases you could uh, certainly do with dishes of only about uh, 0.4 of a meter in diameter or even less. It depends a bit on particular technical circumstances. And my, and my particular suggestion there, which I'll read from that, is that paragraph three should not apply to the general rural zone and that instead you could, you could have in the general rural zone no more than nine dishes are permitted. No more than two of these may have their centers above 2.5 meters height and no more than four shall exceed 0.4 metres in diameter. Can you repeat that, please? Uh, okay, that's that's in my text, sir. You, you're reading from the text. I'm sorry, yeah. I was I was reading further up. So, so no, it's, it, that. It, it, it's it, underneath where I have in heavy type. I yep. suggest that paragraph three not apply to the GRZ, okay? Um, I have skipped ahead a bit um, because there isn't that much time. Um, or at least I thought there wasn't. Uh, that is to say, the reason I'm saying that is that their center should not be above 2.5 meters in height. As far as I understand it, um, you can have uh, in the rural zone an implement shed uh, without any um, need to apply for any sort of consent. It's just part of the normal day-to-day -day business of running a rural property. So you can have these dishes at no greater height than such a shed would normally impose on the environment. 
and I think therefore for these smaller dishes uh, there should, no be, should be no limit provided the height is not greater than I suggest there. Mr. Mr. Arnold, it occurs to me that you know, uh, like the principal issue that I think that the council are trying to manage are sort of external visual effects. In a rural site, presumably, you could manage some sort of setback from the boundary uh, without any difficulty. And in fact, you might want a setback from the boundary to preserve your sight lines. So pick a number. <laughs> Well, that depends on the boundary, of course. I mean, from a road boundary, I would be happy to suggest, uh, huh, depending on, well, yes, from the road boundary, I'd certainly be happy to suggest 20 metres. From an internal boundary within blocks, that might be more complicated. Um, maybe 10 metres. But you see, there's the question of whether there's a, there, that's a public access or not, and everything else. Mm. Am I getting in in the direction of what of, of, of where you would like me to go, or what? Uh, is, what no, is... I, uh, uh, I might encourage you, but I won't go that far. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but quite apart from anything else, I would need. Uh, this is a collective decision uh, that the panel makes, and I haven't conferred with my colleague. That was just something that came to my mind, just as you were talking to me. Okay, well, certainly the road boundary is not not usually a problem. Um, I have particular concerns regarding just saying any boundary because some sometimes um, that needs actually further consideration. Um, but from the point of view of what I'm suggesting is an experimental activity part of the time, you um, in terms of the radio uh, part of it you certainly would want to be further away from um, public access anyway because of the further considerations regarding um, electric fields and uh, uh, power levels and everything else. So, I mean, from in terms of the public, public road boundary or anywhere where the public has access, I would be happy to go to 50 metres, something like that. I'd also like to add something which I've um, alluded to in the last part of that page, that first page, and that is that um, the frequencies that I'm talking about are actually far higher than are already used much in New Zealand. In other words, this is a development and experimental activity to some extent. And therefore, it is highly relevant to development of the art that these multiple um, dishes or other antennas, but particularly dishes in this case for the high frequencies, be permitted simulta into simultaneous use for comparison of how the frequencies are performing. Furthermore, as the technology progresses, these frequencies will become more commonly in use in all sorts of activities. And you see that with the progression from 4G to 5G, and even within 5G cell phone networks, people are starting at fairly low frequencies, but going up in frequency as traffic density and data bandwidth requires it. So, uh, what I'm saying there is that we need to permit people to develop these activities as reasonably freely as possible without undue restrictions on what it is they can do. And the radio, radio amateurs are involved in this activity um, at, I would say, fairly low cost and fairly low impact. and it should be uh, permitted rather than restricted. Mr. Arnold, could I ask um, how big 
could you get um relative to a sky dish stuck on top of someone's house how big are the dishes that you were talking about well that depends on the frequency i'm talking of um for my what i'm talking about for these additional dishes yeah uh -huh, i have one i can show you i was going to ask for a photo of it. okay can you see so this is about the size of a small sky dish. This is 0 0.37, 0 0.34 of a meter in diameter. It doesn't have to be bright aluminium. It could be painted. <laughs> is, this the moment, is this the moment where we ask you to take a selfie with that next to your head uh, <laughs> and email it to the hearing administrator for the hearing record? I could do that, but not immediately, perhaps. <laughs> so, yeah, so how, how big are my... How big it is. So you not what you're talking instead of um, only allowing two of those such things, yeah, I, you're suggesting nine for the reasons you explained earlier. Yeah, well, uh, yes, up to nine. Yes. And so how you said though that they they vary in size depending on what frequency you're using. Correct. So so that if, if you wanted to cover all of them, how much bigger or smaller? Do right. You you would, you would you would preferably. Have, have the existing limit uh, as proposed is are uh, two dishes yeah. okay and one is one is up to 1.2 and one is up to four meters and i suggest retaining that for the lower frequency bands right for the higher frequency bands i'm talking about you would need dishes of that size i've just shown you plus uh, also smaller ones um, right still okay so you would you yeah. would go down to about half that size possibly or even smaller for the highest frequency bands and then um the the dish thing, um, and then you're suggesting that it gets you stick it on. I'm going to use layman's to a pole, or you attach um, to the ground and you have it so that. And as you described earlier, they're not going. Um, if they're not bigger than a um, implement shed or something like that, do you yes. stick them in a um, an array all all together, or do you have them all spread out? You could put them on the side of a shed if you had a shed. Yep. Easily, you, you could put them on all on one pole uh, at uh, right. various heights, but if, because of the height restriction, you might need several poles. But they wouldn't have to be any higher than, as I say, the two point five meters. So they're not much higher than, well, no higher than a deer fence after all. Yeah. Thank you. That's helpful. Thanks, Mr. Arnold. Should we go on to the Yagi aerial? Okay, so my second submission point is about the rope yagis. And I supplied you with photographs of those um, on a separate sheet because it is a somewhat radical change from what you perhaps have seen in terms of amateur yagi antennas. The idea here is that, again, for higher frequencies than some, used in amateur radio, it becomes desirable to use quite large numbers of elements, yet the frequency is such that the elements are themselves short. I'm talking here in specifically about 50 megahertz and 144 megahertz amateur bands. So wavelengths of six meters and two meters and therefore the elements are, as indicated in those photographs, are in one case up to uh, almost three meters, and in the other case, just slightly over one meter. And instead of a boom, which was the way the original uh, paragraphs were formulated, there is no metal boom there are ropes which are in tension and they support the entire array. And this array is then probably uh, only one to two wavelengths up in the air. So no more than already foreseen for the supports. So, at, and six meters that would be between nine and 12 meters height. And on two meters between two and four meters high. And the visual impact is very relatively small because the elements are between three millimeters and six millimeters thick. And that is also the thickness of the ropes required. 
the photographs show ropes and elements uh, up to about um, nine millimeters, I think. And those are using materials which are no longer optimum. You would use using higher strength materials for the ropes. You can certainly go down, I think, to six millimeters. So it was suggested, I've gone into these dimensions in some detail because that was what was suggested by Louise White in her comments on my original submission. Um, the fact is though, because you have so many more elements, the length of such an array can be quite considerable. And certainly over 13 meters would be desirable. Uh, there are designs which I would like to implement first on an experimental basis anyway, up to 30 meters and maybe up to 60 or even 90 meters. However, the whole thing is, as I say, of extremely low visual impact and not great height. Um, I give you also there for comparison, a standard Yagi array of comparable performance, uh, which is made in England and has a boom, which is about uh, 108 millimeters diagonally thickness and uh, elements which go up to 16 millimeters approximately. So there is a considerably less lesser fit footprint on for this type of rope yagi. Um, I can uh, go on to say that there are already con in, in, in rural areas considerable lengths of aerial wires used for supplying electric fences and these would be typically number eight wire, which is 3.3 millimeters diameter. And sometimes that's insulated as well, which would take it up to that same five to six millimeters I'm foreseeing for these largest of the rope yagis, which I'm talking about here. Um, I think that covers more or less what I'm trying to convey there. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Um, Given your evidence about this particular development of Yagi aerials, if we were trying to come up with a definition of what is a Yagi aerial, what would it be? I, well, this is slightly, I agree, there is a bit of a problem in, insofar that this term has been adopted from an early stage without too much consideration of exactly that. Um, I agree that conventionally a Yagi has always been considered to have a boom. Although if you look at the original papers, publications by Yagi and his, and his colleague, they were considering just an arrangement of rod elements with no visible means of support, as it were, because then that was something of a theoretical abstraction. In physical terms, you have to have something to support them. So I suppose you you're talking about multiple rod or wire elements, which are parallel to each other, and with some means of support. Now, the big difference which operationally I see here is that if you use the boom type construction, the hole can be rotated easily, which is of advantage for some radio operations. The type I'm talking about here are per se, very difficult to rotate. They are a fixed direction only, which again is sufficient for what some people want to do. However, there are differences, considerable differences between the two constructional types. It looks to me like in these examples, they're just strung from between, between, between some trees. Is, is, that, is that the case? It can be, any support. So you could use a pole and a tree or two trees or two poles. Mr. Arnold, um, 
what, uh, when you're saying people for use using these, the, sorry, what do you use it for? Like, why, okay. Why why go to all this trouble? Well, um, that is an interesting question regarding why radio amateurs want to cover long distances, but they do. They uh, try to push the technology to the limits of what is possible using uh, the technology. And in the case of these antennas, that means uh, communicating from one length of New Zealand to the other. It also means bouncing signals off artificial and natural satellites, including the moon. Right, so the idea is that you, you the purpose of these is to e extend the range so that radio communication can be what established between distant. point A and point B. For us. Between okay. distant stations, correct, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. And um, if you don't use a, a Yagi aerial, um, what's the, the distance that you can achieve, for instance, with the dish array that you talked about? Well, again, for the frequencies concerned, uh, you would not use, they are different antennas uh, and different frequency ranges. So for this, say for the 50 megahertz range or the 144 megahertz range, you would be unable to use a dish which was large enough. So they're really not comparable. The dishes only come into their own at the frequencies above one gigahertz, say so 10 or 20 times higher than the frequencies I'm considering for this particular antenna. Gotcha. Again, it's a question of the relationship between wavelength and the structure which you're using. Any other questions for Mr. Arnold, Commissioner? Um, so you, don't have, you don't happen to have a photo of a Yagi aerial that's not a rope one, but the other kind, and what well, I'm trying to understand what it looks like when it's not strung up by ropes like that. Okay, if, you, if that's yes. what it's called. Well, if you go to that reference I've given you at the bottom of the page, oh. I don't know if you have access to the web. Yeah, you can sit, you can see the sort of thing I'm talking about. Right, think no, that's thank you, that's helpful. And that is a large and heavy antenna. Mm. Yet, there is apparently someone in the United States who has used six of them in one, in one assembly. Is, sort of, is this sort of like the bigger Big Mac? <laughs> Could only happen well, in I America. I can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't actually say what motivates um, that sort of... That sort of construction, it's not, but uh, yeah. it's not located in Texas, is it? <laughs> I can't comment on that either. Oh. Uh, Commissioner Pramari, do you have any questions for Mr. Uh, Arnold? Um, no, I don't think so. Thank you, Mr. Arnold. Um, thank you. I don't have any questions. Any last point? No. Uh, thank you very much for your time, Mr. Arnold. And as I say. My parting shot is, if you could please take a picture of a of that one little aerial you held up, because in terms like we will we will have that image in our minds, but in terms yes. of the formal record, it'd be helpful if you could put it next to something that so 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 it so you can so it's obvious how big it is. Yep. Scale. Like, so, so, so give us give a sense of scale, not yes. like, not in the sense of down to the last millimeter, but as you say, as I said, take a selfie, yeah, with it next okay. to your ear, uh, and that'll give us the perfect uh, image of how big it is. Okay, I'll do that, and and fire it through to uh, our hearing administrator. That'd be helpful. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Hey, and so. Thank you very much for your time. It's been quite instructive. Thank you. Uh, uh, teach us about uh, a world that uh, I personally was only vaguely aware of, but uh, it's quite yep. very interesting. Thank you. You're very welcome, and uh, good luck with your further hearings. Thank you very Thank you. much, Mr. Allen. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, 
Mr. Botha, are you out there? Hopefully. Hi there. Can Hello. you hear me? Hi. Good morning. Good morning again. Good morning again. It's once once more with feeling, Mr. Botha. <laughs> yes. Um, we have read your statement um, that um, because of the overlap, I asked the hearing administrator uh, to send you a copy of the joint witness statement that the acoustic experts came up with, make sure you were aware of it. Uh, but aside from that, it's over to you. So, um, thank you, sir. Um, I'm, I won't go through my statement. I did read the joint witness statement and I have listened to some of the acoustic uh, experts giving evidence to date in front of you over the last four days. And I, I, I just have three comments to make and then probably leave it to questions. And, and so my comments are in relation to noise um, rather than the renewable energy uh, electricity chapter. So um, reading the joint witness statement and listening to all the legal submissions, it appears to me that the primary reason um, that the reverse sensitivity, sensitivity rule is being pushed is it, with respect to health, protection of health. Um, and amenity gets thrown in there too, but I would suggest that the health must be the primary reason that it's, it's, it's being, uh, the reverse sensitivity rule is being pushed. Um, the joint witness statement also acknowledges that there are existing effects on neighbours to both the rail and road corridors, um, but doesn't go on to address it. Um, I suggest if the 100 metres is the magic distance to which these effects needed to be mitigated by future landowners, that people already within 100 metres of those corridors are suffering health effects um, because of the road and rail corridors. Uh, nowhere in any of the submissions did I hear any discussion on how those two agencies or council are hope to address the health effects on the existing residents along those corridors. Um, the, the, I did a calculation since nobody else seems to have worked it out um, that there are six or well, close to 1700 building points within 100 meters of the existing corridors and at an occupancy rate of about 3.2 people per house in Porirua City, there are 5,300-odd Porirua residents suffering health effects from the, 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 the uh, NZTA and Kiwi Rail corridors. Um, if part of the, um, the goals of those agencies is to reduce the noise, um, then treatment at source is the most effective way um, and you know if there is going to be some barriers and reduce speed limits changing road surfaces changing train timetables then those sort of mitigations would help any further subdivision adjacent to the existing houses so why it's necessary for a new subdivision to put in acoustic mitigation when potentially the long-term solution is to to sort out the uh, the, the noise at source. Um, my, my second point is um, with respect to the assumed rail uh, sound level used for predictions as stated in the joint witness statement, the noise witness statement, which is said to be, it needs to be assumed at 70 dB. Uh, I mean, the only real evidence I can see for this number is in Mr. Lloyd's uh, report to council the 7th December 2018 in which he includes on page 12 and he called it table 4 titled Kiwi Rail Train Noise Predictions for South Taranaki. So Mr Lloyd has referenced a submission and it's interesting to note that in the footnote of Mr Lloyd's report that 
table was provided to him by Dr. Charles in correspondence from 2013, and its predictions for the South Taranaki district. There have been no predictions for porosity, um, you know, um, which could easily have been done. Um, but in Mr. Loy's report, he, he talks about uh, 70 dB from that table um, and references that it applies to two trains or two freight trains per hour. There's a column adjacent to that one, which is 3 dB lower, so 67 dB, which is equivalent to one train per freight train per hour. In Mr. Loy's report, he states that in the Pororo district, there are 10.5 trains per day, which is less than two an hour, or, a, so, yeah, sorry, less than one every two hours, or if, by um, less than 0.5 trains per hour. So that would, if you reduce it from one to 0.5 trains per hour, it would take another three dB off. So you're down at 64 dB as a source, looking at information provided by Mr. Lloyd to council. Um, it's also interesting that there are no predictions that have been done for the Pororo district and no noise measurements. Um, it's interesting that also that Wellington Water have very accurate topo data for the council um, or for the modeling produced for the council for this plan change, that they were able to model water flows up to 0.2 centimeters or whatever it was, but it's, it's claimed that there isn't sufficient or accurate topo data to model and the noise from either the rail or noise corridors, or rail or road corridors. And then my, so the final point I just wish to make is um, with respect to the 100 metres and comments by Dr. Charles yesterday with respect to Transmission Gully. Um, Dr. Charles inferred that to meet the World Health Organization standards um, along Transmission Gully in places that noise corridor might have to extend to beyond 100 metres. He didn't state what the assumed noise level from the road was, so traffic volumes, speed limits, road surface, gradients. Um, and by suggesting that the noise corridor on a new road might need to be further than 100, 100 metres doesn't imply that the noise corridor on existing or other roads needs to be 100 metres. Or... So um, that kind of part of the whole discussion was missed. Uh, it's also interesting that all the work done for Transmission Gully are, are, are predictions. So somebody's modelled traffic volumes and come up with noise contours for that new road. And I find it extremely difficult to believe that Waka Katai, who's must have expertise at modelling traffic volumes, can't tell the panel what's going to happen on the old State Highway 1 route. I mean, if they've modelled traffic volumes to justify the building of Transmission Gully, surely somebody knows or has an idea on how much traffic, whether it be trucks or passenger vehicles, are going to be left on the new State Highway 59. Um, and in order to make a, an assessment of what would happen to the, the the noise levels on those roads. One might simplistically suggest, Mr Botter, that whatever is predicted to be on Transmission Gully is not on State Highway 1. Exactly, yes. <laughs> but, you know, somebody's got the information, um, somebody's made assumptions on how much traffic is going to flow on Transmission Gully, and therefore it's implicit that that traffic won't be on 59. And yeah, which has an impact on the on the noise levels. And so they, I, I, I believe they could have been modelled, or somebody has a better idea on what those were reduced to, and hence what that noise corridor on State Highway 59 could be. So, so uh, that's what I'd like to say about uh, what I've heard to date, <laughs> and leave it to. <laughs> to answer questions which might be more productive. Uh, certainly have one or two questions. Um, uh, first of all, 
I was intrigued by your quantification because uh, I'm not suggesting you should have been, but uh, Ms. Williams, the planner for Kaingora, told us that she'd worked out that there were 1,300 and something land parcels adjacent to the state highway network. You've combined the, the road and rail network, but you've identified buildings. So the question is, how did you go about doing that? What was your methodology? So I think the answer to um, that was given to you was respect to land parcels, new land parcels. Um, well, that's how I understood it to be. So land parcels that could be developed on in future. Uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm not even sure that that's right. I th like I, th I thought that I thought it was existing land parcels, some of which were developed and some of which were not. But maybe that's not okay. right. But 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 yeah. you did. T tell me what you did. Because so, so what I did was this is an interesting comparison. Um, th there's a data set which shows building points uh, around New Zealand, but I extracted the building point locations within the Porua district. Um, yeah, well, when you say building points, what's a building point? Is that an existing well, building? That, that's an existing building. And and as I said in my original submission, I couldn't distinguish between residential houses um, or, or a bunch of units. So there could be six, six dwellings within one building point or whether it was commercial or some other use. However, um, so I then met, had the noise corridor zones that were provided by the council and simply did a count uh, using the GIS on the number of building points within those corridors. Um, um, it, the 1660 I came up with, it, it won't be exact um, in terms of uh, residential occupancy, but it's not 160 and it's not 16,000. It's, you know, there's 1,700 odd uh, buildings within that zone. And so that's um, so that's existing buildings. Uh, that, that's, that's existing buildings and I've, so that's the extent of the existing problem. Or, 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 or the, the buildings that are currently subjected to noise levels in excess of the World Health Organization guidelines. Um, when I, um, obviously you were listening, um, the message we got reasonably unsubtly from uh, Waka Kotahi and Kiwi Rail is that they're operating under designations that have no noise conditions and that nothing that goes in the district plan is going to alter that. So how do we address that? Uh, well, yeah, um, that, that is a, an interesting question. I mean, they, they have themselves acknowledged that there's existing issues. And so, and, and it comes back down to the health impacts because it's, it's all, you know, sheets back home to, to the primary reason for this. So. There's no quantification of how many people may build houses close to these corridors in the future. And, and that is all they are trying to protect, so making the problem worse. But in discussing that, I mean, the fact that they acknowledge that there's an existing problem and don't appear to be doing anything about it strikes me as uh, <laughs> not a a great way forward. I mean, in, in a lot of operations, whether it be airports or, or ports or cars, I mean, everybody's trying to reduce noise emissions. Um, Kiwi Rail, the, the whole noise issue is in their hands. They control the timetable, they control the trains, um, they control the speeds. Um, they could do manage the noise effects themselves um, quite easily. Um, but, you know, um, you know, over time, if in, if if uh, Waka Katai or Kiwi Rail are going to put in noise barriers to manage those effects on existing houses, then that will manage the effect on future subdivision in those zones too. Um, and from a noise perspective, um, you can speak to any acoustician, they'll always tell you that 
trying to um, reduce the noise at source is your best opportunity or, or, or the where you should focus. So, um, so I mean, I, I, I just think, um, you know, the reverse sensitivity rule will almost discourage them to do anything about the existing problem. I don't know if that answers your question, if it doesn't. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, it's quite a conundrum, all right. Uh, the other question I had for you, Mr. Botha, was about the Norwegian vibration standard, and you saying that your understanding is that it's for measurement and assessment of vibration levels at buildings that already exist, rather than those assessed prior to the assessment prior to construction. Uh, I've read that somewhere else. I think someone else told me that, but I'm not sure. I can't remember who. I think it was one of the acoustic experts. Uh, but the question for you is, why should that matter? Well, so, um, I mean, one of the, the big issues about um, predicting vibration levels is, is the ground, and you've heard it from others, the ground conditions between the, um, the source and the receiver. Um, so, uh, the, the requirement uh, to get the prediction right is going to mean whether you do a geotechnical survey between um, the source and the receiver. So, it seems to be unnecessarily complicated, um, and, and you know, and, and extremely expensive for a, a a user or somebody adjacent to the rail or road corridors to implement. I know I had some discussions with colleagues at um, at Marshall Bay Acoustics, and they were shaking their heads at this one too. Um, so, um, you know, I, I'm not a vibration expert. I'll admit that. I know more about acoustics and vibration. Um, but from all my digging and discussions, um, it it's not the the best standard to implement to manage the effect. Um, Commissioner Sinclair, any questions for Mr. Botha? <clears throat> so, um, just in relation to that Norwegian, if it's not the best standard, then which one is? That, that, that I, I can't um, help you. Okay. I, I, I mean, Dr. Charles yesterday gave you a vibration limit, and 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 perhaps having a vibration level without specifying the standard um, uh, might be um, as the best solution. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Primaro. Kia ora, Mr. Bolter. Um, yes, you raised some, you raised some very uh, difficult issues, challenging issues uh, for the panel and for the PDP to address. Um, I don't think there's been any dispute um, amongst the experts about you know, the best way to treat noise effects being at source. Um, but of course, as you say, um, the reverse sensitivity effects issue being brought into uh, prominence uh, to the degree it has through the district plan provisions um, may provide a little incentive for Kiwi Rail and Waka Kotahi to uh, address noise effects. In that, in that light, are you, what is your, what is the relief that you're seeking? Are you, are you suggesting that um, in that context there's really no place in the, in the district plan for provisions uh, to um, ensure that future development within the corridor um, provides for insulation um, to address health effects primarily? Or, or are you, are you accepting that um, a precautionary approach uh, is appropriate in this context, um, despite the fact that the cost ultimately may end up uh, burdening the, uh, the property owners themselves? rather than the generators of the noise. So in, in my written statement provided most recently, I, um, the relief I 
suggest there is to remove it completely. However, I, I, I acknowledge that one almost needs to pick your battles, and, and since council have introduced it, it, it <laughs> I, I wonder whether it will be removed. So I, I suggested as an alternative, the 100 metres has no place, and it should be 40 metres. Mm. Um, I mean, the whole 40 metres to me is interesting too, because prior to the PDP being uh, published or, or put on the website, there was a draft set plans which I was I, I wrote submissions on and at that point I picked up the mapping errors which have persisted through this thing on on the corridor whether it be drawn from the boundary or, or the rail edge um, and and at that stage I questioned um, where the 100 meters came from and why was it in there I got an email from council and I looked it up yesterday um, uh, from Rachel Law dated 8th of October 2019, which said it shouldn't have been 100 metres, it should be 40 metres referred to the Hutt City Council plan. And then, you know, so, so and then it changes back to 100 metres. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and I'm told, why should we follow the Hutt plan when yes. I've been told by council that it's following the Hutt plan? So, mm. so, so the, in terms of relief, I, I would prefer that it got removed completely. Uh, but failing that, if, if, if you see you need to um, have a reverse sensitivity, that it should only kick in. Uh, in the zero to 40 metres. Mm. Thank you for that clarification. Kia ora. Um, anything? Uh, I think that's us, Mr Bother. Thank you once again for your contribution. Uh, always interesting, always worth the price of admission. Uh, yeah. And uh, as I say, we're uh, wrestling with these issues and uh, and 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 your assistance is appreciated. Oh, yeah. So did you um, have any questions on the renewable energy? Uh, no, I think I, un I understand okay. where you're coming from. Uh, right. uh, that uh, the, the council staff ha uh, agree that you have picked up some interesting points. They're, they've also queried what scope we have to change, uh, change them because they're not subject of submission. So we need to think about that pretty hard as well. Oh, yeah. Hey, thank you uh, once thank, again. Thanks, thanks for your time. Yeah. Is Nati Tower present? Oh, well, we'll adjourn to wait for uh, Nati Tower to come online.
Hilda, can you hear me? For some reason, I can't make my video work. Uh, let me just give, give me two minutes. I'll see if I can make it work. Here we go. Yep. What in there? Um, so the time's mine, yeah? The time's mine, I can start. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you have the floor. <laughs> so what would you like to tell us? Um, well... Uh, first off, kia ora, uh, kau ho te wairua, ka matara te tinana, he aroha ki te aroha, kā kā te rama, te hei mauri ora. Uh, tēnei te mihi atu ki a koutou katoa, um, good to see you all again. Um, ko ai au, ko Nami Solomon tōku ingoa, he pau tō matarau, ki te runanga o tō rangatira. So, um, I think I've, I've made submissions to you all before, but as a reminder, I'm Naomi, um, and my role is pau tō matarau at te runanga o tō rangatira. Um... I think my submission today is only going to be quite short um, and will only be submitting on the Three Waters chapter um, of the proposed district plan, um, though I am happy to answer any other questions on topics being heard in this hearing stream, um, if any of the commissioners have questions for me. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Porirua City Council for the work, um, for working with Ngāti Tour on the PDP to date. Um, just noting that it's been a really long process and there's been a lot of people changes and and things throughout the time that that um, I guess have have made it a little bit of a bumpy road along the way, um, but I guess that that's that's to be expected as part of the process. Um, in terms of our submission, um, we note that the three waters check the focuses on hydraulic neutrality and the three waters network capacity. Um, I intend to make submissions on both of these points, uh, noting that the chapter largely focuses on water volume rather than water quality, uh, which we understand sits um, largely within the jurisdiction of Greater Wellington Regional Council. Um, so on the topic of hydraulic neutrality, um, I note that the definition talks to the management of stormwater from new lots or developments. Um, we're, we're supportive of the definition including on-site disposal or storage as this places the onus on developers to think about the management of stormwater as part of their developments. However, we are unclear on the details of how this should be achieved and point out that, um, and, and we point this out, as we believe that there are innovative solutions to stormwater management that need to be considered across our city um, if we are to modernise the way that our three waters in infrastructure is managed now and into the future. Uh, we would have preferred that water sensitive design provisions were explicitly included in the plan, um, though we note that this is being promoted through the requirements of hydraulic neutrality and compliance with the Wellington Water Regional Standards for Water Services. Um, the PDP acknowledges that requiring hydraulic neutrality can, exist, um, can assist in minimising the discharge of stormwater contaminants into water bodies. However, we have concerns around the concept of hydraulic neutrality, as this does nothing to stem the flow of stormwater, which already inundates and infiltrates the wastewater system um, and is the cause of overflows into our streams and harbours, thereby creating water quality issues. Um, the proposed policies do not respond to how this will be resolved or by who. Um, who is responsible for ensuring that the volume of stormwater runoff does not have negative impacts on our precious water bodies is the question that we'd ask. Um, in Porirua, even, slight, even slight rain events can cause wastewater overflows, given the current state of stormwater and wastewater networks. Um, however, we know that with climate change, we will see more extreme weather events, and this will only lead to exacerbation of the volumes of water that we currently need to deal with. 
Um, in short, the definition of hydraulic neutrality essentially means that developers cannot make things any worse than they already are, um, but the system is currently broken. So what are we saying? What we're saying is that the concept of hydraulic neutrality does nothing to turn the dial to make things any better. Um, on the topic of network capacity, um, I note that the move by Porirua City Council to tackle poor three waters infrastructure is a positive move. Um, the objective outlined in the plan goes some way to try and meet the concerns I raised in relation to hydraulic neutrality and that it speaks to having sufficient capacity to accommodate the resulting demand. Uh, however, as noted above, it's, it talks to resulting demand of which I understand to mean the new stuff. It does nothing to address the current stuff. It is unfortunate to see that the framework proposed is focused on the number of houses in the demand rather than encouraging best practice around how a site can and should be improved. However, um, oh, I don't mind. Um, and we believe that placing the onus of responsibility of for water quality solely on the regional council um, is short-sighted given the interrelationship of the water cycle, but also because of the upcoming plan changes that the regional council will undertake shortly um, with the impending three waters law reform, the inclusion of the concept of Tamana or Tiwai in the national policy statement for freshwater management and with the release of the Te Awarua Purirua Whaitua Implementation Plan in 2019 alongside the Ngāti Tō Statement and the Mahi that Ngāti Tō and Purirua City Council have been doing together to ensure that Purirua is a harbour-centred city. Uh, we believe that more work could have been done in this Three Waters chapter um, to better address concerns around all parts of... Um, I guess all of the issues that that we see um, the planning system responsible for. Um, just on in terms of the planning system at both the district and regional level, we see this as being a package in or suite of rules and regulations that help to address the numerous issues that have had a negative impact on our environment. Um, the system also empowers or enables development to occur in a manner that provides for good environmental outcomes. Um, we believe that this is in addressed in part by um, strategic Direction FC01, which talks to infrastructure needing to be adequately enabled to provide for effective, efficient, safe and resilient functioning city, including supporting a high standard of living and having sufficient capacity to accommodate existing and planned growth. However, we do not believe that three, however, we do believe that the Three Waters chapter could better reflect the interrelated nature and responsibilities of Purirua City Council, Greater Wellington Regional Council and Wellington Water. Um, in terms of Mr Smeaton's report, I understand that recommendations, well, that it recommended amendments to the chapter, um, and then in relation to our written submission, that it looks to recognise the modi of Porirua's waterways, Te Awarua Porirua and Te Manawa and that this continues to be compromised. Um, firstly, we thank Mr Smeaton for his willingness to suggest this amendment, and understand that the recognition of the effects on Te Mauri or Te Wai is consistent with the Tangata Whenua strategic objective. Um, this is particularly relevant to the topic of stormwater contaminant discharges to water bodies. It is this practice, alongside others, at the scale in which it takes place across our city, which has an impact on Te Mauri or Te Wai. I understand, Mr Chair, that you had a question about the additional wording and the somewhat incompleteness of the sentence that is proposed. Um, I agree that it is incomplete and that Speaking of Modi being compromised doesn't quite fit um, what Ngati Tor's uh, aspirations in relation to this um, chapter are looking to achieve, um, particularly given that the chapter looks to address water volume issues rather than water quality issues. Um, if I could, I would suggest that the chapter simply recognises that it is a step towards maintaining the Modi of Porirua's waterways, Te Awarua Porirua and Te Monorokoa. Um, just in closing, I told you it was going to be short. <laughs> um, we would like to see a plan that is enabling and provides for development, but in a way that ensures not only protection, but improvement of our environment. Uh, we understand that there are limitations on the ability of the PDP to be able to do this, given that planning standards are developed at a national level. Um, 
but we would encourage Port Hudo City Council and the panel to ensure that this plan, particularly in, relate, in relation to Three Waters, is bold and innovative. Uh, we don't need more of the same, and bigger pipes and giant retention tanks are not the only solution. Uh, we know that with the proposed reform heading towards us, changes in the way that the network is managed will happen, um, and we take the view that um, we're, we're, in a, we're at a point in time where we can and should make the step changes required to ensure that our systems are fit for purpose, modern and innovative for now and for future generations. Kia ora. that's our submission. Thank you, Ms. Solomon. I'll ask Commissioner Pomare to go first. Nga mahi o te ata. Tēnei te mahi atu ki a koe, Naomi. Uh, o te rā ki a koutou, Ngāti Tōr, uh, te māngai o, o te tangata whenua o te, o te rohe nei. Nā reira, kā nui te mahi atu ki a koutou. Thanks very much for your uh, submission, Naomi. Um, you did say that it was going to be short, but there was a lot of information uh, in that submission, and I wonder if you might be able to make your notes available to us to ensure that we don't miss anything there. Um, you've, covered, you've covered a lot of ground uh, in relation to the Three Waters chapter and uh, interrelating aspects of the PDP, and I'm really pleased that you've picked up on the um, Section 42A recommendations because I really wanted to focus in on um, on your original submission um, and also the further submission um, which details the um, recommendations that you were making to the plan. Um, in terms of the recommendations uh, in the Section 42A report uh, to include, well, you, you've highlighted um, You've hi highlighted in a, in, a, in a very clear uh, way the importance of uh, um, protecting Modi of waterways within the Purirua catchment, um, and that that continues to be an ongoing uh, issue for, of concern for Ngāti Tōa. Um, and you've highlighted how a lot of those water uh, quality issues um, are related, in your view, to um, inadequate infrastructure. Um, so I'm wondering, in the context of the Three Waters chapter, are you um, satisfied uh, that Modi is intended to be addressed through the introductory chapter uh, to the Three Waters part of the plan, or did you, I mean, were you, were you intending, what was your intention? How were you envisaging um, Modi being addressed through the Three Waters chapter? I think first and foremost, um, recognition that the concept of Modi is very important to Ngāti Tō. Mm. Um, an acknowledgement that uh, water infrastructure is a contributor to negative impacts on Modi, but it can also be a contributor to positive impacts on Modi too. Mm. If, um, you know, water infrastructure is, is, is built in a way that provides for that. Mm. Um, I guess um, related to what I was talking about in the submission, um, and seeing the various plans at district level and regional level being a kind of suite of rules and regulations um, that um, how we address negative impacts on Modi in particular um, need to be thought about um, across all of those different plans. Mm. And I suppose we envision that in some way they the plans would address and talk about Modi in a complementary way so that as a suite of rules and regulations um, 
our concerns for the protection and enhancement of the Māori of Aotearoa mm. um, could be addressed. Mm. And I think we've come at this topic in that way because we have been involved with regional council in the development mm. of the Tawaroa Purira Whaitua plan, and all of this stuff was discussed. Um, and recommendations were made in the FITO implementation plan around changes to or amendments to be made at both the regional and district planning level. Um, we understand that the district plan is only seeking to, well, that this chapter is more focused on volume rather than quality. Um, And I think that I get. I guess to Modi or to why we we see the Modi of the water and and how water is is managed um, as being more holistic than um, I guess what the compartmentalised nature of the planning system hmm. creates. Um, yeah, and so I think we just. We, we're hopeful that um, this chapter goes some way to recognising that it is part of a bigger picture um, rather than, as it seems um, from an initial reading of it, um, that it's somewhat chosen to be responsible for the volume part of it and absolved any responsibility from any other parts of what contribute to impacts of te mauri or te wai. Mm. Um, whereas <clears throat> I guess we're probably more um, favourable of the view that it should acknowledge that it's part of a bigger picture. Mm. Um, and if the other part of that too is because we know that um, often when people are having to apply for consents and discharge to water bodies as part of that, that they're going to need to apply for both consents at a district and regional level. Mm. Thank you for that explanation. And I mean, you've done, you've highlighted the um, integrated approach, I guess, that um, Ngāti Tōa uh, is, is um, trying to take and working closely with the Wellington Regional Council and Puriroa uh, City Council in developing a a more holistic and integrated approach um, to managing water quality and quantity issues um, in the district. Um, and, and I think the chapter does um, go some way towards acknowledging uh, that and addressing the ongoing issues there. Um, but you have highlighted the issue of Modi um, in the context of Te Mana o Te Wai, and you've noted um, you know, the, the recommendations from the FITUA implementation uh, program and all the work that was done um, there between Ngāti Tō and Regional Council, Puridua City Council, in um, developing those recommendations. Um, and you've also highlighted, of course, the, uh, the significance of the, the provisions in the uh, NPS for freshwater management in Te Mano Te Wai, which um, Regional Council do have primary responsibility for implementing. And you've raised uh, the challenge of, um, you know, how, how more uh, cognizance uh, could perhaps be given to, uh, to all that work and um, that sits in the background uh, behind the, uh, the Three Waters chapter and how you know, greater consideration of Modi uh, could perhaps be reflected in the chapter. Um, so I'm cognizant of the fact that the what what you've what you've said is that you feel that uh, Modi is now recognised, and you wanted that's what you were seeking was initially, or first of all, recognition that the concept of Modi is important to Ngāti Tua. Um, and I think the recommendation, from what you've told me, it appears that the recommendation made by Section 42 Officer does uh, address that issue to your satisfaction. Is that, is that correct? Or are you... I mean, what, what worries me a little bit is that there doesn't seem to be any provision for the recognition of that Modi. So 
it's recognised in the introductory part of the chapter, but it's not provided for uh, through the policies or provisions uh, of the chapter. And I'm just wondering whether that is something that you are seeking or whether you are comfortable at this stage for the issue to be um, recognised uh, in the context of these other um, bigger changes that will be occurring as a result of the MPSM in the near future? Yeah. Um, I think we're comfortable with it being recognised, though the wording that's being suggested, I'm not sure, um, necessarily does that explicitly. Um, and part of the reason for that is that this the way that the sentence is written is somewhat incomplete. Um, mm -hmm. I think that ideally we'd like the policies and objectives to speak more directly to how Modi can be recognised mm -hmm. in, um, I guess, how Modi can be recognised. I'm not entirely sure how <clears throat> the policies and objectives would do that, though. Um, and I guess kind of just off the... Oh, I, with this. I think that this is partly why we would have preferred to see some provisions around water-sensitive urban design, because I think that those are... That's an area where... Um, more explicit rules could be potentially written um, to help address concerns about negative effects of storm water runoff to the Modi of water. Mm. I understand. Um, I understand what you're saying, and um, the difficulty in, in um, establishing clear linkages uh, between addressing b between what you're proposing in terms of addressing Modi and. Um, and, and providing for appropriate infrastructure. Um, I do note, though, that in your uh, further submission, um, you've supported the Greater Wellington Regional Council's <coughs> submission points in relation to um, the addition or amendment of objectives, policies and rules so that the PDP gives effect to the MPSFM because the MPSFM according to Ngāti Tor in your, in your further submission, supports the well-being and health of our Wai and can support the restoration of several catchments, rivers, streams that are significant to Ngāti Tor. Um, and you have sought that um, additional amendments to objectives, policies and rules uh, in the PDP be allowed to um, occur to give effect to the MPSM. So I wonder if that might be a way one way of addressing uh, your concerns? Yeah, I think so. And I think that um, with the law reform that we know is coming our way um, mm. and the changes that will take place at the regional level, um, I, I guess I, I am... Um, uh, what's the right word? Concern's probably not the right word, but I just... I have a um, an inkling, I suppose, that that those changes in, in regulation and policy are, are going to end up requiring some kind of plan change at the local level yeah. to do that anyways. Yeah. And so I see that the PDP is an opportunity to have potentially front-footed that. Mm. And or actually, in, if not front-footed it, be, being, you know, bold and innovative and, and, and taken some leadership on, on the matter because it's something that's facing communities across the country. I understand I understand your point and I, I also understand from what the Puridua District Council, the City Council has also said um, that it, it is a challenge uh, to be able to front foot the um, uh, freshwater management um, aspects of City Council's responsibilities through the PDP because the Regional Council haven't yet um, developed uh, their response to a degree that would allow that to occur. Um, but having said that, in my um, 
discussion with regional council yesterday, uh, they were quite comfortable um, with the notion of including um, additional provisions in the PDP um, designed to give effect to the NPS FM in relation to Modi. Um, so if, if the panel was of a mind to um, consider something like that, would that be appropriate from Marty Tor's point of view? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and I think that, I, I suppose, alongside that, um, the way that the system's been geared to date is that different people have, or different organisations, councils, regional, local, have responsibility for different parts. But I think in terms yes. of um, creating step change required to um, ensure that the modi of water is restored, or um, I suppose in, in other words, um, our, our environment, um, particularly water, um, is of an appropriate level that we can, you know, swim in it and collect kaimana from it and, and, and all of those things, um, that it does require that integrated approach and mm -hmm. that um, I think that it's something that, that together we all need to take responsibility <coughs> for. Thank you. Just, um, just one more question in relation to that. Um, the integrated approach and uh, the need to consider a, a holistic, um, consider the environment in a, in a more holistic way, uh, particularly when dealing with water quality issues. Um, you've, you have referred to um, the FITUR implementation program a number of times in that context, and um, that's also an issue raised in your further submission, uh, where you requested the adoption of relevant recommendations um, yep. from the FITUR implementation programme uh, in, the, in the provisions of the PDP. I just wonder um, whether there might be some merit in considering your uh, request there in relation to um, the objectives and policies of the Three Waters chapter, in particular the hydraulic neutra neutrality provisions, because they are <clears throat> specifically designed to uh, reduce, um, you know, adverse impacts on, receive, on the receiving environment, uh, and therefore uh, improve, if you like, or at the very least maintain, if not enhance, the modi of uh, water in the, in the receiving environment. Um, and of course, at the heart of, or underlying uh, that, that objective uh, is the range of um, solutions and recommendations that uh, you and the Regional and District Council have, have put together in, in the context of the FITUR implementation program. So I just wonder whether you see some value uh, in perhaps um, extending uh, the provisions that are already there in the Three Waters chapter to include a reference to uh, Modi um, and perhaps um, and perhaps look at um, uh, requiring some sort of um, uh, consideration of the recommendations in the FITO implementation plan and in um, developing hydraulic neutrality neutrality solutions. What would your view on that be? Yeah, I think that um, that's definitely a good place to start. Um, there was a lot of um, time, effort, expertise um, gone into the development of that FITOR plan and I remember that hydraulic neutrality was a co of that was spoke about at length um, and so I think that that having a look at those recommendations and consideration of those recommendations into this chapter um, can only be helpful and mm -hmm. useful and um, 
I guess, additional to that, um, the Ngāti Tō statement that sits alongside the Whaitua implementation plan um, will, I guess, should hopefully help to um, provide some guidance on, um, I guess, our, our values and perspectives around um, what a lot of those recommendations um, say. Um, mm. I guess the only kind of additional point that I'd add to that is that there is a piece of work currently underway um, in relation to um, the Te Awarua Purirua Whaitua program. Um, well, actually, in relation to Ngāti Tōl's part of that. So, so the issue is that um, Te Mana or Te Wai wasn't part of the national policy statement for freshwater management at the time that the Whaitua report was released. So mm -hmm. we're doing a bit of work to um, develop up what Te Mana or Te Wai means for Ngāti Tō and Purirua. Mm. Thank you. Ms Solomon, uh, as you observed, uh, I was quizzing Mr Smeaton about that sentence, and to be fair to Mr Smeaton, uh, he picked up what precisely what was in your submission, and which, as, as a, I think we both agree, is somewhat incomplete. So I'm thinking, uh, continues to be compromised by what? That's what I asked him. Uh, and from your presentation, uh, I, ha I would infer that there are a whole range of things that might be compromising Maori, and but among them, high on the list, are the uh, capacity of the waste and wastewater system and infiltration of stormwater. Now, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's what I drew from your. Uh, is that is that correct? Yes, yes, that's correct. And we should presumably say, among other things, because there will be a whole range of things, as you say, taking a holistic view, but in a three waters co context, those are the number one things to be focusing on. As it were, as I say, is that right? As I don't want to put words in your mouth, but in there, if it's wrong, tell me what it, what, sh what it should say. Um, I don't know if I'd say that. Well, how do I put that? I think it's definitely correct to recognise that um, that kind of stormwater runoff. Um, Infiltration and you know, inundation is 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 a key contributor to negative impacts on Modi. Um, where was I going with that? Um, yeah, I, I guess recognizing it in a way that suggests that it's not the only it's not the only contributor, but that it is a major contributor, is an important one. I guess I'm just cognizant of the fact that. A plan will stay around for quite some time, and what the major impact or contributor when the plan's written now might not be the case in, well, hope it's not the case in <laughs> 10 years' time or whenever it's time for the plan to be reviewed again. Um, but I, I, yeah, I largely agree with, with your comments. Thank you for that. Uh, Commissioner Sinclair, any questions? Nothing from you. Any last thoughts? No, right. thank, thanks very much, Naomi. Uh, thank you very much, Ms Solomon, and to uh, your colleague who's been sitting, watching patiently but silently in the background. Uh, we appreciate your input again, and we'll look forward to seeing you in future hearing streams. Kia ora, thank you. Kia ora. Kaki te. Kaki te, thank you. Thank you. We'll adjourn the hearing to await the arrival of the amateur radio team.
Mr. Lake has Hello, arrived. Indeed. Yes, indeed. Uh, so would you care to introduce your team and then tell me uh, we have a, pr a procedural issue to start with and uh, and then we can uh, talk about how we're going to go proceed. Mr. Lake has arrived. Yes, indeed. Uh, so would you care to introduce your team and then tell me uh, we have a, pr a procedural issue to start with and, uh, and then we can uh, talk about how we're going to go proceed. Mr. Lake has arrived. Bit of, bit of feedback in the system there, but yeah, good morning. Bit of feedback in the system there, but. Uh, so this is a test, see if this works. You're on mute, Mr. Cameron. It's working uh, for this me. Is the test, see if this works. Can you hear me? Yes, can indeed. Good. Okay. Good morning. You're on mute, Mr. Cameron. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, my team um, consists of, there are three witnesses, um, Mr. Milner, uh, and they are, and their, their backgrounds um, and professional qualifications are detailed in the introduction to the synopsis, which I'm going to seek leave to, to file late and out of time in a moment. Uh, but Mr. Milner will be our primary uh, witness and will explain all matters of a technical nature to you other than to the extent that other witnesses, Mr. Robertson and Mr. Lake, will contribute from their particular areas of expertise. Mr. Robertson, of course, is um, he has a primary responsibility for amateur radio emergency communication systems and is particularly au fait with the role of amateur radio in, 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 in emergency situations in New Zealand. Um, and Mr. Lake, has been really coordinating this process for this club and um, responsible for marshalling the information, but he has a particular knowledge concerning the background and history and membership of the club. Uh, nonetheless, uh, he is a highly qualified engineer in his own right. So um, my role, I hope, is to, is to just briefly um, introduce matters and um, give you some context for how this matter has been um, developed from the submitter's perspective and then to hand over to Murray in particular to explain to you the concerns that um, the submitter has regarding the proposed form of the rules. Uh, Mr Cameron, I should alert you uh, I think that one of your members uh, has been listening, uh, but we've already heard from Mr Mike Arnold this morning talking to us about uh, dish aerials and um, uh, rope-mounted um, Yagi aerials. So just be aware that we've had a preliminary warm-up on amateur radio issues. OK. Um and I'm, I'm not quite sure what the relevance of that might be, Mr. Robinson. Sorry. Uh, 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 I don't think it's a, a particular relevance, just so you're aware of it. Okay. Um, so my, my first task, of course, is to seek leave to file the synopsis that I've prepared out of time. And I do so on the basis that um, I, I was asked to assist the submitter towards the end of the Christmas break and um, while, still on a while still on holiday and I agreed to do so assuming that I would be able to carry out the work uh, by the required, well within, a, within the time frame that I, was, that I understood was required but unfortunately um, I had an emergency that I needed to deal with out of town due to a flood to a property that I had to address 
and so was um, away from my office for a week prior to the uh, Waitangi weekend and really that somewhat curtailed my ability to to attend to this matter and and I apologise, I, I should have on, on reflection sought leave to um, file this um, synopsis as I call it um, outside the time frame in a, in a more orthodox way but um, nonetheless uh, what I've endeavoured to do is to provide you with a synopsis of the evidence that was provided by the submitter um, with their submission and contextualise that and to ensure that uh, some of the more um, obtuse scientific issues that arise in this context become a little more legible in terms of how they may be applied uh, by you and considered by you in the context of this proposed district plan. So I've taken some care over that and it took me a little bit longer than I thought it would possibly because I come afresh to the task in terms of any technical knowledge of the issue. Um, but I've done my level best to, to provide you with um, material that, that gives you the basis to, to understand and then consider the issues of concern to my client, having regard, I know, to the issues that the council wishes to resolve. Uh, uh, yes. Mr Cameron, I, I understand completely uh, uh, you'll put, uh, you don't have to lay, uh, belabour the point. What I'm concerned about is there a, is there any risk of prejudice to any third party? Um, I, I, I I'm not aware of any risk to any third party in this context because um, the issues that have been raised were were raised by the submitter in the materials initially filed and substantively so what I have done is translate those issues in a in a relatively practical way and then uh, ensure that they can be properly understood in the context of uh, the relief that has been clearly flagged. Uh, certainly uh, your client's submission is nothing if not fulsome Certainly, certainly more detailed uh, than most that we have seen. Uh, I suppose the only question is, are there any further submitters on the submission, if further submitters in opposition? I'm not aware of any, and I'm not aware of any that is prejudiced by, by the provision of a, a synopsis which en endeavours to take the detailed material of accompanying the submission and putting it into the, the broader context which this synopsis provides. All right. Uh, take it as a given. That's uh, good enough. Uh, I'll issue a minute in due course, but, uh, but uh, tr uh, tr treat leave as granted, and, uh, and let's get on with it. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate the opportunity to provide the explanation. And, I, uh, and again, I, I apologise for any inconvenience this may, may have caused you, the commissioners, in having to read material late. So um, I appreciate the um, appreciate the, uh, the leave being granted in the way that you have. So the context from my client's point of view, if I can just summarise it in this way, as they see it, there is a disconnect in terms of an understanding of the science rel relevant to or relating to the operation of amateur radio and the outcomes sought by council, in particular in relation to the use of Yagi aerials. That disconnect is effectively governed by an understanding of what I will term propagation. And I'm reading from a background, back, further background material provided to me yesterday by Mr. Milner, and I'm happy to provide it uh, subsequent to the hearing, because I think it, it, it may well be uh, of assistance. But what he says to me is, it is important to recognize that high frequency propagation is highly variable as noted in the submission or in yeah in the submission filed 
it relies on the ionosphere to deliver non-line of sight propagation. And as the ionosphere is continually moving and changing in consistency due largely to the state of the sun, the propagation of radio signals between any two points on the globe will vary dramatically by time of day and frequency in use. I'll have Mr. Milner go on to explain to you why that issue means that from the point of view of amateur radio, and Mr. Robertson can speak further to the issue of um, amateur radio's role in relation to civil defense and, uh, this, and response to, to, to natural disaster. But why that means that retaining a broad flexibility to maintain um, high frequency uh, transmission through all conditions is vital if amateur radio is to deliver the outcomes reliably in times of disaster in particular, but also for civil defense where required. And for that purpose, they consider the Yagi aerial necessary and needs to be available within the residential and rural zone because without it and without it being available given the number of members that they have, that will create a problem for the for amateur radio over time and their ability to carry out their mandate. I also secondly make the the point that the relevant 32 and 42A reports were prepared prior to the recent amendment to the resource management legislation, referring of course to the enabling of housing legislation, which establishes a completely new permitted baseline for the height of buildings. And therefore issues of amenity which seem to be of primary concern to council in the residential zones were considered in relation to the existing environment as opposed to this, this new environment that has been statutorily established. Mr Cameron, has it been established yet? Um, it is enacted. Yes, but, 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 but is, is it in the plan? <laughs> um, there will be, the, well, I think to address that point, the legislation requires it to be in the plan and will require it to be in the plan to the extent that any exemptions can be said to be limited or it can be reasonably anticipated that they will be of a limited nature and that the criteria to be applied to those exemptions are restrictive and they do not apply and those exemptions do not consider amenity. So to that extent, it, it is my submission that in the context of this hearing and this process, that permitted baseline must inform the decision making relevant to my client's submission because the concerns that have been raised by council of by council uh, by reporting officers more properly stated relate to amenity considerations rather than any of the the, 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 the sorts of exemptions that the statute might permit to be considered but albeit to be applied on a restrictive basis. What, so that's uh, my general understanding of the legislation. Uh, my, my point is that, um, or my understanding of the 2021 amendment is that there are changes to the limit, there are limited changes to the NPSUD that apply immediately as from yep. the 21st of December yep. uh, that are set out in one of the schedules to the Act uh, but that the medium density rules and standards will only apply when there is a variation which has to occur by August 2022. 
So, hence my question. Uh, is there a, as we stand here and now, is, is there a permitted baseline? Are we anticipating uh, the variation uh, and uh, that the variation will be in place by the time of decision? Like, I'm not saying that's not an unreasonable assumption, but I want to be clear what, you, uh, what it is. I, I, I think I have to concede that it's, it's more comfortably within the latter proposition rather than the former. But nonetheless, it's a most unusual, if not from our point of view, in terms of practice, unique situation in that we have a permitted baseline being defined by statute or determined by statute and um, made clear, and it is made clear within that legislation that it is to be applied with limited exemptions. Uh, the other, the, the other issue I have is, until we see the variation, do we know where, where and how the the qualifications, the qualifying matters, will bite? Um. I think it can be anticipated that they will bite generally. If by that you mean, sorry, I, I should just be be clear. What I'm saying, what I'm, what I am submitting is that it can be anticipated that the twelve metre height limit established by the legislation in the schedule can be reasonably anticipated to be widespread to be to be to be applicable through much of the residential zone of the Porora city just as it can be through the residential zones of all cities uh, to which the legislation applies thank you mr cameron uh, roll on I, 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 I do not, to, to be fair, I, I don't, I don't consider this to be a, a submission that is being made on the basis of anticipated legislation, which of course would be um, problematic. What we have is legislation we understand what the general purpose of that legislation is, what the intended scope of that legislation is, and what the purpose of that legislation is. Its specific application is one that yet that is yet to be determined, given that the relevant procedures have yet to be initiated and finalised for that purpose. But in my submission, it would be, <laughs> in my submission, it would be unfair to my client to disregard what I submit to be this modified permitted baseline modified at least to the extent that it is st statutorily mandated and contemplated for general application with limited exemptions. Uh, summarising my understanding of the position, Mr Cameron, um, it's anticipated legislation to the extent that any variation to the plan is, is, has the effect of a regulation but the shape of it is clear because the legislation is in place. It's, it's directed that it occur within a defined time that is likely to be in advance of our decisions. And so when we come to make a decision, it will be in place and we will know at that point exactly what it says. 
Uh, so we're anticipating to that extent, but we're anticipating on, we have good grounds for anticipating. Is that fair? That's fair, I agree. Uh, the other uh, more uh, technical question is, to what extent does the permitted baseline apply to plan making? Uh, like clearly, it's relevant to the de to decisions on resource consents. It's a discretionary element under Section 104. But to what extent does uh, the permitted baseline influence uh, the formulation of a plan? Is it like is it like uh, like the uh, Section 104? Is it discretionary? Can you point me to any authority telling me? what role it plays in the making of a plan? No, I can't because, of course, we haven't been as yet confronted with that situation because the this legislation is in and of itself, as I understand, well, as, as, I, as I have submitted, it, it is a unique situation unique as yet in this country because we've never had legislation which has purported to establish a baseline of the kind that this particular legislation mandates well, or requires. Or requires. Uh, yeah, yeah, like I, I appreciate the, 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 there couldn't be any authority on this particular permitted baseline, but I'm thinking more generally of the relevance of the permitted baseline to plan making Uh, so, for instance, we've had uh, we've talked at great length to other submitters about the NESETA, which establishes permitted activities in in relation to um, the national grid. There's the the equivalent for the uh, for the telcos. There, but the question is: so so is there any authority? on application of the permitted baseline to plan making generally that you're aware of? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr Cameron. Please, please continue. I'm just contemplating the proposition, you know, um, and I, I dare say the reason, if I'm correct, that there is no authority on that point, and I'm not aware of it, and I can't bring bring one to mind um, in response to your question. Um, the reason for that must be that. The statute, of course, is a statute is of a higher order of authority to the planning process. And the planning process is required to implement statutory direction. In the same way, that in the context of the consideration of a national policy statement, for example, a district plan process must implement what is required by that national policy, by any national policy statement. So perhaps the problem is the use of the phrase permitted baseline The point being that it is the statute which establishes a height limit that is permitted for the purpose of any plan to which it applies. And I, to that extent, it is highly analogous to a permitted baseline 
analysis as opposed to necessarily being one and the same, if that helps. Yes, I understand. Uh, the, the reasoning uh, uh, is in that we call it that we have RMA practitioners treat the permitted baseline as a term of art, but if you go back to before, yeah. before it was uh, codified, it was, a, it was a concept that came out of the Court of Appeal and I think you're appealing more, more to the broad concept that the Court of Appeal judges were talking about than to what we now know as the permitted baseline. That's true. That's fair. So, and, yeah, that's helpful, thank you. So, um, to that extent, and, and assuming my submission on the point to be accepted uh, in terms of its relevance to the consideration of amenity, it, it is my submission that the concerns of the reporting officers regarding amenity have been substantially qualified by this legislation and there is no formal landscape assessment made for the to assist you which has regard to this legislation and that's not a criticism I mean it, it's simply a, a factor of timing and um, it just it's just the way things have have played out but my clients are proposing an outcome for an aerial, which is really, in my submission, little different to the maximum height contemplated by the legislation, having regard to the fact that aerials will be permitted as of right on the top of buildings of 12 metres in height within residential zones and without limitation. Is that in the MDRS standards? I don't, I don't under, I have not seen any limitation in those standards that pertain, that relate to aerials or structures on roofs, such as chimneys. Uh, it like, it, but do, does it, do they actually enable aerials I haven't, stu I, haven't studied the, I, I haven't studied those uh, those standards in sufficient detail. I've got enough problems studying the existing uh, provisions. I, I can tell you that I don't think they contemplate it, frankly. So one has to assume, and I do assume, that while the legislation is silent on the point, it would be absurd with respect if aerials were not to be permitted on buildings of that height in the usual way. The legislation is unusual and some might suggest unsatisfactory in a number of respects and, and, and I, I I don't wish to get into the philosophy of that, but the, the fact of the matter is I can't point you to anything in the legislation which defines um, what height of chimneys or aerials or other structures is permitted, such as air conditioning systems and the like, um, on the top of 12-metre um, high residential structures. Is the reality that when, when we see the... Uh, the IPI variation will know at that point. Yes. We will know at that point, but again, I, I simply make the submission that it can be and, and should be anticipated that standard form of structures of this kind will be permitted on buildings of that height. Well, 
Mr. Cameron, does the National Planning Standards and the definition of height provide any assistance in relation to that matter? I'd have to I'd have to double check. I'm sorry, Mr. Scofield. Mr. Cameron, please carry on. So, ha having raised the, the issue in the way that we have, my client is, is of course, willing to, to listen and has wanted to listen to options that might be available to address or accommodate concerns of council while ensuring that the role of amateur radio is not unduly compromised by the height limitation that is presently proposed. In my own thinking around this point, it can be, and I think it should be accepted, and my client is minded to accept that, for example, an aggregation of Yagi aerials in any specific location may prove or may, may be considered to be adverse. But equally, for their efficient operation, Yagi aerials, I'm informed, and I'll have Mr Milner speak to you f further about all of this, need to be spaced by at least or in the order of one kilometre apart because they can interfere. Each can interfere with the operation of the other. And so this does give or lend itself to some ability to distinguish, to, to provide provisions which may control the number of Yagi aerials in any specific location while permitting them within a residential zone on the, on the basis that their efficient operation is maintained. Is the reality is the is the reality that uh, given the setbacks required, you're only ever going to have one on a residential section? Yes, you're only going to have one on a residential section, and you're only going to have one in an area, at least within a specific location of some. And I'll ask Mr. Milner to to explain. Um, Within a separation or distance of at least of no no less than 500 metres from each other, but ideally a kilometre apart, as I understand the position. Now, to that extent, um, that that raises the ability to to avoid aggregation while maintaining the level of flexibility having regard to propagation issues that I summarised at the outset, if we can craft a set of provisions that have regard to all of this. I have briefly discussed this with my client and to this extent, I do have it in mind that we could look, if not at a permitted activity outcome, a controlled activity outcome, where the controls prevent aggregation, which lead to inefficiency of operation, which will have the benefit of avoiding aggregation and the difficult and any issues of concern concerning impact on amenity. And I think. That is an issue having regard to both the science 
and concerns about amenity that should be thoroughly considered and explored within this process. Unfortunately, I do come to this late, and I, I, it is you know, one of those situations where in the filing of, this, of my client's submission, a set of provisions which thoroughly considered all of this um, as for, you know, in terms of the, the various options that might be available have not been fully explored. And so to that extent, if it's going to assist, I have suggested at the end of the synopsis that we are happy to sit down with, with, with officers to, 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 to try and work through any of these issues to see if we can reach a, a position which may lead to a more comfortable um, outcome being, or a, 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 a consensus being identified that can then be reported back to you. Uh, is the reality, uh, Mr. Cameron, that your client's submission is very clear what it was seeking, which, and in summary, it's that um, that the same standards that apply in the rural zone to Yagi yeah. areas apply in residential zones. Uh, like, is there anything to talk about? Like, it's it's a it's either the same standards or some intermediate standard, or something lesser. Yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, some yes. intermediate standard between what there is currently and what there is in the rural zone. Yes. And as I see it, activity status such as introducing a controlled activity status might be something that could be worked through and is within scope. Um, just in terms of uh, the um, the operation of the uh, the provisions that we have, one question that I posed to the reporting officer is: Does the plan need a definition of what a Yagi aerial is? Uh, I, I'll leave Mr. Milner to to, to answer that. I think uh, uh, the. Uh, but yes, uh, it would be. Uh, it, it, it is a. I understand a Yagi aerial to be a, um, a very common form of aerial per se. Uh, but I'll have uh, Murray discuss that with you perhaps more fully. Uh, so you agree in concept, it, well do you agree in concept it would be good to have a definition and then I'll yes, discuss sir. with Mr Milner what that definition should say. I'm not yes, expecting you to right. tell me that. <laughs> I, I'm obliged, Mr. Robertson. It's 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 Mr. Robertson. It's been a, it's it's an interesting. This whole area is very very interesting in terms of the 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 detailed science concerning um, railway uh, radio and, and amateur radio in particular. So um, the more I delve into it, the more specific I find the technical information needs to be. So um, I think it is desirable that there be a definition, but it. If it is to be a definition, it is a definition that needs to be specific to amateur radio is the best answer I can provide, I think. In other words, the generic form of Yagi aerial is not relevant to this consideration. So there are generic forms and there are very specific forms. The, the other thing that I wanted to raise with you um, is that having read your submission and having read also the statement of Mr Arnold who gave us some photos of a particular type of Yagi aerial incorporating ropes uh, is that the panel thought it would be a good idea if you could consult with your clients and give us, uh, say, two or three addresses that we might visit and actually see 
the range of uh, Yagi aerials that are being used in Pairua, preferably from the street, not so that we understand how visible they are from public places, but just so we don't need to disturb the landowner and go to the trouble of getting an appointed time. If we can, if we can see what we need to see from the street, that would be preferable. But like, obviously, if that's not possible, then we need, we we will make arrangements. But as I say, the, our request is, can you talk to your client and uh, feed into the hearing administrator um, so some potential site visits we might undertake to get a better appreciation of, of what these things do look like. Uh, I, I have raised that and they consider it to be desirable and yes, I will send you addresses. Uh, and the last thing I need to ask you is that you've referred us to Judge Smith's or the decision of Judge Smith's court in Tauranga in 2012, yes, that you rely on, and I uh, should I should refer you to the Capity decision, of course, of Judge Dwyer. Uh, you anticipate uh, where I'm going, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Cameron. Yes, I do. Uh, a question for you is: I understand that the amateur radio community sees the Carpety decision as an outlier. But from our point of view, it's much more recent than Judge Smith's decision. It's much more local. It's also the judge that will hear the appeals from uh, our decisions. So I, want, uh, I, could, I suspect I know what your answer would be. But tell me, on what basis shouldn't we take Judge Dwyer's court's views as a clear indicator as to the direction we should be taking? The primary reason is that the decision has been overtaken by the recent Resource Management Enabling Housing Supply and Other Matters Amendment legislation, and that the analysis within that judgment obviously did not have the benefit of that legislation for the purpose of the consideration of what I understand from that decision to be the primary concern, namely amenity. And secondly, um, it, it is generally submitted that from the amateur radio community's perspective, a better understanding of the science and role of amateur radio will better inform the decision making process than occurred in that Capity case with respect. And thirdly, by exploring the activity status in the way that I am suggesting, it is possible to address amenity nonetheless, at least to the extent that aggregation is avoided, while ensuring that the nature and purpose of amateur radio can be, will not be unduly compromised, as my client considers the Carpety decision um, does. Thank you. Um, is there anything you want to add before we move to your clients? No, uh, no, there's nothing further I wish to add. But I should ask my colleagues if they have any questions. Commissioner Primari? No. I think we're ready. If you want to start with Mr. Milner? Yes, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
I think the, the critical issue from um, our point of view is that um, we need to stress that amateur radio has been a permitted activity for close on 100 years um, and is um, very much ingrained in both international and national uh, regulations and treaty arrangements through the international um, radio regulations and the telecommunications union in, in based in Geneva. Uh, and as such as part of the treaty arrangements associated with the United Nations. And the New Zealand government um, certainly till now has um, followed the international situation very closely. Um, the key components of that are that each operator is licensed by way of examination to a common standard, uh, and they must individually and collectively comply with the uh, National Telecommunications uh, Act at the moment as uh, uh, 1989 and related regulations. Um, the purpose of the Act is to make sure that um, we do not interfere with other services using the radio frequency spectrum and that they do not um, interfere with each other. So uh, it's very much a matter of ensuring that uh, radio operators, whether they're amateur radio operators or radio operators for any other radio service that's used around the globe, do not interfere with one another and that they can all operate in harmony. And we need to make sure that that continues. Uh, the legislation, legislation serves the national interests and provides the operation of amateur radio in communities. Um, it's based, as I say, on the international protocols and regulatory frameworks uh, through the international frameworks. And both Peter and I have been to a number of these forums where the radio regulations have been reviewed, uh, various components of them have been changed and spectrum has been reallocated um, as appropriate, both for amateur radio services and of course for emerging new services such as uh, cellular and the amount of spectrum that's been allocated in that space in recent years. It's important to note that the general usage radio license, which mandates um, our um, license uh, premise is written in accordance to Article 25 of the International Radio Regulations. And it says that amateur radio operators are encouraged to prepare for and meet the communication needs in support of disaster relief. So independent of any other um, bodies that exist involved in emergency, com emergency communications, we have that as part of our license conditions. So we have to uh, satisfy that condition uh, come what may. It's important to note also that um, the local radio clubs, of which there are enough, uh, close on 100 around the country, uh, and the Titahi Bay Branch uh, Amateur Radio Club um, is one of those, is, is required to work with its members to help educate, to help um, uh, ensure that operation is um, properly executed, um, that they are experienced and able to operate so that they do not cause any difficulties within respect of both the licensing conditions and the international radio regulations. At the same time, they are in, in, uh, assisted in terms of uh, crisis to ensure that they um, uh, help out in terms of natural disasters, search and rescue, and other crisis management situations. So um, we are continuously involved in that, continuously involved in training associated with that. And um, Don, who will speak a little later, is, uh, provides leadership of those services on a national basis. It, it, it needs to be recognized that um, the work that we do cannot necessarily be undertaken by other providers. Um, we have that, have, it, we operate on a voluntary basis. We provide the communications. Uh, we keep up to date with the latest techniques. Um, the communication systems today are complex and, and are now highly digitized. When the internet fails due to loss of power or um, a mobile sites get jammed up through heavy traffic use or uh, damage through to earthquakes and those sorts of things, um, the 
high frequency equipment and other services that amateur radio uh, operators provide uh, provides the backup to those capabilities. So when all else fails, uh, because there are a distributed number of amateurs around, yes, they will have suffer some damage on in certain situations as well. But the probability is that their equipment will be available much more readily and much more quickly than nearly any other service available on a um, wider basis. So, for instance, in search and rescue, the police re prefer to use VHF point to point line of sight type um, radio technology. It provides very good service, very good capability in most conditions. However, the high frequency radio is still taken out in backpacks to ensure that when the search teams are down in a deep valley, they can still get communications out to um, uh, the appropriate uh, base station. So it's important that all of these things are taken into account when thinking about the services that Amateur Radio uh, supports. Can you just pause there, please, uh, Mr. Milner? Can I just ask at this point? Can you can you perhaps explain, <clears throat> having regard to the issue of propagation, the the need or the desirability of ensuring that there are a range of aerial aerials available within the network to ensure that communication can be maintained? in the widest variety of conditions that can be anticipated, both in relation to disaster and civil defence. Okay, just picking up on the point of propagation first, as indicated earlier, propagation at high frequency is based on reflection off the ionosphere. The ionosphere goes up and down. It has more or less ionisation, depending on the um, uh, condition of the sun, typically sunspots. Um, and therefore is highly variable. At certain times of the, of the day, you can use certain frequencies to um, provide reliable communication, say between Auckland and Wellington, uh, but other parts, other times of the day, those, com those um, communications may be completely impossible. Um, likewise, um, you may well be able to provide a communications path at, uh, when, when the path between Auckland and Wellington is not available uh, at the, with the normal fr uh, frequencies, uh, it may well be that you can still talk to someone in Australia or Japan or the US using a Yagi antenna and then actually relay the traffic from a, a distant location back to Auckland, say. So, um, you know, depending on the, the frequencies that you choose and the type of antenna that you choose, you can adapt to almost any conditions which the ionosphere may, be, may throw at us so that communications can be maintained under a large range of conditions which would not be otherwise possible um, because we have the flexibility to operate at different frequencies with different types of antennas. And the Yagi's role in all of that? The Yagi provides the, is, is, a, is a, an, an antenna which provides uh, a, a role whereby the energy is directed in specific um, directions. So therefore, if, if um, there is a path which is um, uh, a dipole with, with dipoles at each end using wire, simple wire antennas, uh, you may not be able to get between Auckland and Wellington with a Yagi antenna with the gain provided and the um, noise reduction provided by the uh, reduction in side lobes um, you may well be able to provide the um, the the, serve, the, um, the connection. Likewise, um, when you're working with longer distances to Australia, North America, wherever, the Yagi provides a very high gain and directional capability to a specific location, and then it can be redirected back to New Zealand from that location if that if the other end also has a Yagi antenna and where dipole antennas may not be working on that frequency at that time, the Yagi antenna is highly likely to uh, function satisfactorily. And therefore the importance of the Yagi antenna is what? The importance of the Yagi antenna is that it gives you um, a much um, more reliable um, transmission between two locations. Um, you know, we can, under good ionospheric conditions, um, simple antennas will work, 
but under difficult ionospheric conditions, using a Yagi will enable you to direct the energy to where it needs to be. Um, with your leave, Mr. Robinson, can I ask at this point for Mr. Robertson to, to add any comment that he may wish to make of relevance to this issue in the context of disaster um, coordination and, and response to search and rescue requirements? Happy to hear from Mr. Robertson. Mr. Robertson, would you like to add to that, please, and, and just um, perhaps develop the point in terms of the role that you play and the importance of being in a position to maintain the, the level of service that Mr. Milner has, has now summarised. Yes, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, so the Amateur Radio Emergency Communications um, is actually 90 years old this month, um, having been established after the Napier earthquake way back then, when the, um, in 1931, when the um, earthquake took out all of the communications and amateur radio uh, personnel actually managed to um, provide that communication for some time um, until such time as the other communication systems were put back in place. Um, so our role from that point onwards has been looking at um, NAC uh, providing disaster relief communications and still does. And we've worked heavily with civil defence and other organisations over many years, over that many years. Um, and it's variable from time to time, depending on the requirements in each different area. Search and rescue is something that we've been doing. In fact, the very first search we did was prior to the formation of AREC way back then. Um, and um, so we've actually provided that um, both for um, the technology advice, also for the provision of operators trained to actually do that type of work. And, it, and to such an extent that the government now contracts us via a joint service level agreement with police um, RCCNZ for Marine and via MOT and Maritime New Zealand um, in order to provide a service for search and rescue and we are funded accordingly. As part of that, providing those communication services, um, we need to be able to ensure that both the teams themselves who are doing the searching are actually um, able to communicate from wherever they happen to be. So as Murray pointed out, the short, the short distance line of sight VHF type um, radio is fine where those line of sights are there. However, we are in a valley, the terrain and the nature of it is as such, um, the teams cannot actually necessarily get the line of sight, can't use cell phone and even satellite communication may not be available to them in those valleys. Um, this is also the case down the South Island where the valleys run um, you know, across the country, up and down the South Island, you can't easily do it. So HF is used a lot just for that purposes to get communication at all. So with that in mind then, with what Murray talked about with the propagation um, of high frequency, which is the only other reliable way of doing it, then while we can use some dipole antennas, the dipole antenna we require to do the broadband, which means to get to the frequency that needs to be used for the, and, and we use the international search and rescue frequencies for this purpose, um, actually as such that you need a fairly large dipole, which can be up to 40 meters between the poles for the wire antenna. So some sections and some locations that are a shape and size that that may not be possible. And if you shorten it, you then reduce the overall efficiency and lower the signal strength, which means we may not, during the propagation, be able to talk to the people we need to. So by using a Yagi antenna of the right size and height, that does allow us then to turn the antenna around to focus on where the signal is coming from and bring boost the signal up to ensure that we get that communication. And so that, A, reduces the risk to those field teams should they have some form of accident. It does allow us to get the communication for the purposes of the incident management team that's managing that search to do the communication, but without it would not work. 
And then secondly, it reduces the risk to the people who are lost that we're actually looking to find to make sure that we can therefore find them and get them out um, safely. So that's the sort of basis of what we're actually looking at. Here. Thank you. And you get government funding to assist with all of this. And, uh, and the process or the, the, the organisation that you are coordinating, you're endeavouring, are uh, you, to ensure that this level of communication can be maintained uh, satisfactorily over a sufficient spread throughout the country or spread of locations around the country to ensure that um, communication can be maintained as required in as many in the most diverse range of circumstances that can be contemplated. Is that, is that a fair summary? Yes, that's correct. And um, it may be in some cases where we have to use a far distance station, whether it's Auckland, Christchurch or somewhere else, to communicate with the team and communicate back to us at the base so that we can do it. And that's, as Murray explained, that propagation can cause it. In order to do that, we therefore need the Yagi at times to be able to do it where the propagation um, limits it. Very good. Okay, Mr Milner, back to you. Okay. Um, I think we can probably um, go to the um, critical issues around the um, uh, given that we need to be able to provide these services, uh, it is imperative that the uh, lo logistical limitations are not imposed, which will prejudice our ability to effectively carry out the role. That's really the bottom line that we are asking for. Um, this is not a hobby anymore um, than um, you would say that a volunteer fire officer is uh, a hobby. Um, we actually do need to make sure that amateur radio is available. It's personally satisfying, no debate about that, uh, but it's available to serve the community and provide resiliency in times of crisis uh, as a key component of our licensing conditions. It is fair to say that, the, um, that we as the submitters were quite disappointed with the uh, Porirua City Council response to uh, this, our submission on publicly notified proposed Porirua District Plan on the 20th of November 2020, uh, 2021, I think it was. Um, the attachments described a, uh, uh, in detail why amateur radio configurations uh, were are necessary and um, the proposed configurations that were put forward by the Porirua City Council were based on technically incorrect assumptions and or a lack of understanding of existing norms and regulations. We provide a lot of detail in the attachment as to the sizes of um, uh, antennas that are, are basically required in order to uh, operate satisfactorily on different frequency bands. And remember that due to the propagation conditions, we need to operate across a large range of different frequency bands and therefore have antennas which will accommodate uh, that range of frequencies. There does not appear to be um, uh, any appreciation, is our feeling, um, that the role of amateur radio in the community has been fully acknowledged. The comprehensive response that we did provide was a genuine endeavour to inform the Barrio City Council of our requirements uh, if we are to serve our community as intended by the regulatory framework, both national and international. The current version of the district plan has followed on from an earlier version which we saw and thought was, uh, uh, was reasonable. In fact, both um, the uh, Amateur Radio Club and our national organisation, the NZART, uh, thought that the original conditions were uh, reasonably appropriate. This is back in 2020. But with no warning uh, and no consultation, um, the Porirua City Council changed a number of the um, amateur radio configurations in the amateur radio section to conditions that uh, would make it basically impossible for us to operate um, and fulfill certainly to fulfill our obligations 
in terms of the radio regulations for supporting disaster relief uh, in particular. So to successfully operate, um, we believe that we must use the high frequencies, uh, high frequency equi equipment efficiently and effectively uh, over medium to long distances throughout both our district, the country and around the world. It is, and this is basically what we've explained in terms of the way in which propagation uh, demands that that occur. It, it, it is to be particularly noted that uh, the legislated uh, HF frequency used by international search and rescue, including in New Zealand at two megahertz, at two megahertz uh, is um, basically uh, lower than the um, um, uh, than you would be able to put onto a um, uh, a Yagi antenna, but it is part of the international regulations and uh, the rules and regulations. And um, we need to be able to accommodate um, all of the spectrum from uh, just above, uh, just below two megahertz, right through to into the uh, very small uh, wavelengths. The The, 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 the key issue for us is, the, um, uh, is that in order to enable um, operation at these frequencies, we need to be able to operate wire antennas like dipoles, um, and, uh, which are typically horizontally configured, and Yagi antennas, which can be either horizontally or ver vertically configured um, to provide medium to long distance capability. The Yagi antennas, because they are more directional than the dipole antennas, reduce interference from the back and the sides and enable longer distances to be achieved because we have gain and reduced noise levels. Uh, both of these types of antennas are essential for operation at in the high frequency bands, uh, depending on the ionospheric conditions. And we're not talking about line of sight, we're talking about reflection from the ionosphere to go large distances, including right around the globe. The um, Titahi Bay branch and, and, and NZART in consultation with AREC uh, specifically requested a decision from council to amend the provision for Yagi aerials in the residential, commercial, industrial zones uh, to uh, enable Yagi antennas um, by prescribing the same standards as the provision already allowed for Yagi antennas in rural zones. This is a, would be a, an ideal situation and it would be allow us to operate identically whether we're in the rural zone or in a, an urban zone. And so we would be able to transmit and receive uh, with uh, uh, equivalent conditions. However, um, we, 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 do, we do note that um, uh, amateur radio is um, uh, able to, is also intended for use uh, around longer distances and around the globe. And this could include the Pacific Islands. Um, and we had a recent situation with Tonga uh, where uh, communications were out for some time. And the main area issue here, there was the fact that uh, most of the HF communication had been removed from the Tongan Islands um, uh, when they put in the um, uh, submarine cable systems. And in fact, most of the satellite facilities were removed as well. Um, so that there was no backup. And yet there were amateur radio operators around the globe trying to provide communications to Tonga during that uh, 48 to 76 hours uh, when essentially there was no communication but it could have easily have been achieved via high frequency uh, radio. Perhaps just one other uh, point I could make is that um, um, it relates to the medium density residential standard uh, that um, uh, Andrew mentioned a little earlier. Uh, and I, I just want to reflect that it's been, it was very helpful that the um, Porirua City Council planner uh, in the um, uh, um, section uh, 32 report uh, defined the, uh, recognized that the ARS4, the, the height condition uh, for amateur radio configurations 
should be such as to, and I quote, enable aerials to gain clearance above surrounding buildings and structures to reduce signal obstruction. And that's exactly what we would see as being essential and the one of the reasons why the uh, medium density uh, residential standard has been raised. Perhaps I stop there. Thank you, if you could stop there. Um, I have asked you um, to consider the issue of the controlled activity status, activity status and whether that could potentially work with appropriate conditions as far as you are concerned. Um, and uh, can you confirm that you are at least prepared to explore that issue if, if an opportunity were to be provided to do so? Uh, yes, we, we are looking for a compromise and, and that would be one potential uh, com compromise uh, direction that would, could be taken. I think the issue for us would be that um, uh, distance alone may not be the most um, satisfactory criteria um, because uh, in many hilly suburbs, for instance, in Porirua, um, uh, one antenna that's um, only a few hundred metres from another antenna would not be visible um, to uh, the, a person uh, in, anywhere. Um, so, um, a, it, again, it's just a matter of understanding the uh, way in which uh, such a, a condition would be applied. Yes. And secondly, um, to preempt the question from the chair, a definition of Yagi aerial? What's your ah, view well, about that? Well, a Yagi antenna is, is was I'm defined sorry. by the um, by the uh, designer of the um, Yagi antenna, which was Professor Yagi, <laughs> not surprisingly. And the definition of a Yagi antenna is a, that it is a parasitic um, reflector, a parasitic antenna which uses a driven element and a reflector, which is uh, parasitically connected to the, um, uh, direct, the driven element and may also have a num one or more uh, directors, which are also parasitically connected to the driven element. And when I say parasitically connected, there's no specific wire, um, wired connection between the um, uh, driven element and the reflector, for example. It is simply a matter of the wave going between the two either reinforces itself or um, uh, causes um, destructive interference. So it's a, um, a mechanism for using um, a, um, ele elements to reinforce the wave going in one direction. Uh, Mr. Mr. Cameron, Mr. Cameron, the um, what occurs to me is that that, that definition is uh, written from, as Mr. Milner says, from the designers. Um, perspective about how a Yagi aerial area operates. What I'm interested in is describing what they look like. Yes. And, uh, uh, and uh, so that um, your, uh, uh, so a council officer could look at a, an application or, a, or an existing operation and say, yeah, and tick, whatever boxes need to be ticked and say, yes, that's a Yagi aerial without technical input. So I, rather than bounce words backwards and forwards, I'm prepared to give you time to consult with your client and give me with a, a definition that fits those criteria. I'm interested, as I say, I'm interested in council uh, monitoring and uh, enforcement so rather than something which would require the kind of technical understanding that Mr. Milner obviously has. Yes, I understand. Fully appreciate it. Uh, so while we're hot to trot, uh, is the end of the week going to be viable? Yes, that's fine. <clears throat> Close the business Friday. Very good. Uh, now over to you, sorry.
I interrupted. No, I, I think we've covered all of the points that, that are of concern directly to us. Are you ready for some questions then? Or, yeah. Um, so, the, only, the, only, the, so only thing I can, the only thing I can materially add is that um, we are concerned to ensure that that you as commissioners are as fully informed as possible of any options that might be available for the in terms of a, a, a planning outcome here that would be satisfactory to my client, bearing in mind the relief that they've sought. And to that extent, I'm, I'm also happy to add to the uh, material that you've requested in terms of the definition of Yagi Aerial a, at least an overview of um, an alternative activity status such as a controlled activity status that, that may be uh, workable um, from my client's point of view. I think that might be a bridge too far, uh, Mr Cameron. I think that you're going to, you're going to have to leave it to us. If you, I'm happy for you to lobby uh, Mr Smeaton uh, in uh, in the in the time that he has available uh, to um, uh, reply to the uh, to your client's position, and uh, but I'm not going to direct that occurs. Uh, but yes. uh, I, I think what but, I'm trying to do here is to avoid um, any. Uh, future difficulty, if I can put it that way, and to ensure that there is a clear understanding of the range of options that might be available in planning terms to, to ensure that um, there's a clear uh, framework that can be acceptable to both to my client and ho I, I hope to counsel. But uh, I, I understand the point you make. Uh, yes, yeah, so as I say, if you want to feed feed any thoughts you have to Mr. Smeaton, uh, that uh, um, uh, I don't want to leave it open, uh, that um, I've previously been invited to direct uh, mediation and I've uh, declined to do that. Um, but if uh, I, I'm sure that Mr. Smeaton will, uh, will approach the, uh, these matters constructively, uh, but be aware He's got a lot to do in 15 working days, so the sooner you talk to him, probably the better. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, the um, my question, first question is: How many members does the local branch have? Mr. Lake, um, I think we can refer to. It is set out in the uh, synopsis, uh, Mr. Robinson. At Paragraph three point five. Yes, I think I re recalled that the uh, thirteen active members. Uh, and to what extent does the existing set uh, configuration of each of the active members need to be changed day to day, week to week, year to year? Mr. Milner. In terms of antenna configurations, um, it will depend on uh, what frequencies the um, individual wishes to use at any particular point in time. Uh, they may well uh, wish to um, change their antenna for configurations depending on the um, state of the sunspots activity, um, which is an 11 year cycle. Um, they may wish to change on a day to day basis uh, in terms of which antenna uh, out of a selection they may use for a particular purpose. Um, so I wonder if I could have just a little bit more clarification on the question, please. Um, I imagine that Mr Cameron has already talked to you, but the RMA authorises continuation of existing lawful activities and changes thereto 
provided that they don't materially alter the uh, nature, intensity and scale, I think those are the words used, of uh, the, the exercise. So I'm interested in how often do you need to change that wouldn't meet that standard? The, 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 once an antenna is put up in the air, um, it can last for in, in that configuration for a long period of time. The issue would be whether um, due to a storm or something like that, something comes down or whether the particular licensed um, operator considers that there is a better antenna configuration which might be used for a specific purpose. Um, and that would, that would be perhaps of a more uh, substantial nature in terms of change. Um, I don't think you need to worry about storms because you can stop for 12 months. Uh, when you say identifies a different configuration, is that a completely different aerial, uh, potentially larger size, or is that... Um, their shape and appearance, or how? What would the nature of the change be? Uh, the nature of the change might be um, uh, a longer element, uh, maybe a an additional wire or two, um, or it may mean um, adding something that is vertical as compared to horizontal, um, or it may mean, which would be a much more substantial uh, change, uh, putting up some form of tower and putting a Yagi on top of it, for example. Um, any questions, Commissioner Sinclair? Um, do you know, um, Mr. Moore, the members that you do have, um, are they mostly in, urban, in the um, rural area or are they in the residential area, where where are they located? I'm trying to get an indication of the um, size of the issue. Is we have a full distribution of them, um, if it would be helpful. Um, um, I'm just trying to locate my copy of that. Do you have that hand, Peter? Peter Mate, I think. Yes, um, I was going to comment there. Uh, branch membership fluctuates around 30. Only one or two members are in well, probably a city would define as a rural zone. The rest of the members are basically in residential areas. And only, to be fair, only a proportion of them are what could be called active amateurs. Um, and it's fair to say that uh, they are distributed at random, so to speak, uh, throughout the Polaroa city. That's one of the values of it, is that we do have in people living in their residential areas uh, just a, a wide distribution for both local and for many of them long distance coverage. As an owner of a Yagi, I could perhaps speak to that briefly. To the best of our knowledge, there are only two Yagi antennas of, for high frequency use, that is of 10, 12, 15 meter size, one in Porora City and one within the urban area, and one out in the rural area on the Pai Kokahiki. Pai Kokoriki Hill Road that's well away from civilization. I actually live in Tawa. My uh, small Yagi, high frequency band Yagi, has been there for nearly 40 years. It came from a life in Western Samoa and Whangarei, so widely traveled. But it's relatively low. You can't see it from the street in front of my house. It's blocked by the bulk of the house and is just sitting there uh, used sporadically as I need to communicate overseas. Uh, thank you. Back to you, Andrew. 
Commissioner um, Pomari, any questions from you? Um, well, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. That's very much appreciated. I think we'll call it a day. Uh, Mr Cameron, uh, I'll issue a minute both confirming grant of leave uh, and uh, the, the leave I've given you to um, file a, a definition of um, a, a Yagi aerial by this Friday. Um, I will await um, your advice as to where we might visit to get an appreciation of uh, what these things look like. Um, judging from Mr Lake's point of view, if there are only uh, two or three around, uh, that might be quite a short list. Uh, it is a short list, and uh, it, it may be that one has to be outside Mr Lake's house in Tarawa, but we'll give you a list nonetheless. Uh, I, think, I, I, think, I think we could cope with going as far afield as Tarawa. It's going to be on the way home, but that's fine. Okay. Uh, that, that, thank I think, you. So I think it's fair to comment. You need to see them to appreciate how obtrusive or unobtrusive they are, and preferably for the licensed radio amateur to explain perhaps why he cited them, located them where they are on his land property on his section. I think uh, uh, I think the message is we do appreciate that we need to see them. If we come come to your property, for instance, Mr Lake, I think the message to you and your colleagues uh, is that we don't want you advocating the case during our site visit, but we may ask you questions about how it, how it works. Yeah, no, that's fine. I understand that. Um, we're we're um, just trying to put our case here. Uh, hey, I, I, I understand exactly uh, what you're doing. I just want to be clear about the ground rules uh, when we come onto your property. Uh, the uh, But we, we do appreciate your input, the time you put in. As I said before, uh, your submission is admirably detailed about both what you're seeking and why you're seeking it. And that's a huge help, and we thank you for your assistance today. And on, Mr. Chairman, and and I apologise, Mr. Sinclair. I, I, I didn't. I'm sorry. The focus is so poor on my machine. I, I, I was confusing you with with Mr. Schofield, and I apologise for that. I, I don't quite know why, but there you go. Uh, well, you okay. get that. Uh, I can see the similarity. Uh, <laughs> I, I have to say, when I think about it, it, it's not as great as I would hope it might be, but given the nature of the year of it, there you go. My apologies. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure Commissioner Sinclair will cope. Uh, so we'll, we will uh, call it a day. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Thank you very much. And we will adjourn the stream for hearing. I think that's it. Uh, and we're back at stream five. Date to be advised. <laughs>